afternoon is called Podcast People, which I think really, uh, that's what this is about, the conversation is about. I'm going to introduce our guests here. I'm not going to give you their full bios. You'll be able to see those on the folded.ca website. But just starting here on my left, Chris Tolley from the Play Me podcast, Phelan Johnson and Leah Simone Bowen from The Secret Life of Canada, and here, uh, Michael Cruz, Tight Walk. So we're going to dive in. I think I'm just going to keep moving in that order, and we'll play uh, a little uh, snippet from Play Me. Chris is going to start talking over the music. Actually, I'd love to play it in just a second. Okay, you uh, tell me when. You cue me. I'm very, I'm very good at taking directions. <laughs> so, first of all, I have to say just how, how excited I am to be here, because I think we're on um, the cusp of the beginnings, the birth of something pretty spectacular. Uh, the idea of digital platforms, we're really in the early stages and we're trying to figure it out as we go along. And it's right now really, it feels like an, just nothing but opportunity and possibilities. Um, and I, I may be like just bitter in five years time, but right now it feels like <laughs> this is going to be uh, an incredible transition that we're all witnessing at this point in time. Uh, so it's great to just have an opportunity to, to exchange ideas and experiences. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Play Me and uh, what we've learned over the past two years and to talk a little bit also about um, the challenges that we've had uh, trying to figure out uh, this new method of delivering theatre and performing arts. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, I'm a co-artistic director of a theatre company called Expect and I work with uh, Laura Mullen. We're both writers and directors and one thing that we love about theatre is the ephemeral quality of it. You have to be in that city at that time uh, to see it. And once it's done, it's gone. Uh, and that's the beauty, because it's magic. Because then it's a communal experience that you're having with a small group of people. But it's also a drawback, because you have to be at that city at that time to catch it. And if you're not there, poof, it's gone. And maybe it will get a remount, but it's difficult to remount shows. Uh, so there's not that many opportunities after that. And we also seem to be working very much so in regional silos. I know that there are some cultural warriors. Uh, I know Jill at the NAC is one. People who are trying to break down those silos. Uh, Magnetic North, what it was and hopefully will be again, really did that as well. But those are exceptions. I think in many cases, it's really hard for people in Toronto to know about the amazing stuff that's happening in Halifax, and for people in Vancouver to know what's happening in St. John's. And Laura and I have a bit of a background, a bit of work at CBC Radio Drama back when there was a radio drama department. And we also have an incredible passion for um, podcasts. And we thought, what if you take all of this and sort of mush it together and bash it around, what will you get? And what we ended up with was playing. So I'm wondering if we could just play that little bit of a clip. No? Absolutely. So what Play Me does, and this is just a uh, little snippet of it, is we take theatre pieces by our partners, and we partner with uh, theatre companies all across Canada. And we take the best of the best, and we transform them into contemporary audio dramas. We record them in studio with the original actors, and then we podcast them free on a weekly basis. And it gives an opportunity for people to hear um, some work that's happening across the country, and it also archives it so that it's there forever. We add sound effects, music, and uh, foley, so we're mashing up contemporary work with an old art form. I wonder if we could. And this is from Iceland. And then there's no more shouting. It's quiet. I hide in the bathtub, but it's not a good hiding place because the shower drape is clear plastic. You can see right through. The door opens, and I think it's the John coming to get me, but no, it's a woman. His wife? She walked right past me like she doesn't see me. It's hard to not notice someone sitting inside of the bathtub, but she doesn't. Instead, she pulls up her skirt 
and pulls down underwear and sits on the toilet and urinates. And then she does So we're trying to strange. take contemporary work and uh, fuse it with um, all the old art form of radio drama. So when we started this two years ago, it was very much an experiment. We had a lot of questions. The first question was, would people listen to Canadian theater? Um, and there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is yes. Uh, to our surprise, our numbers have been uh, higher than we expected. We've hit about three quarters of a million listens. And the thing that really surprised us was four out of five people who listen are international. And what that tells us is that there's a hunger for Canadian stories, for Canadian playwrights, and for Canadian actors. And I think we sometimes forget that when we're in Canada. And what we need is we just need a platform to be able to get it out to a global audience. And I think digital is the answer. Uh, digital is that opportunity to get that out to a global audience. So that was the, that's the short answer. The long answer was nobody listened at first. Uh, we, uh, we had 15 some days. When we first launched, we, there was a lot of buzz and we had a lot of media and then it sort of trickled off and we, we had some days where we had 15 listeners. So we then learned that you really have to do a lot of the hard work, a lot of the grunt work on the ground. So that meant uh, connecting with communities, listening to the audience. So we, we did uh, Better Angels, which is actually about a Guyanese uh, nanny. But we had a huge spike in people from the Philippines listening. Uh, so we went, oh, OK, we've got to, yeah, we've got to listen. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we connected with the Philippine community. And all of a sudden, we had people who weren't uh, traditional theater-going audiences connecting to this theater piece. Uh, we also created strategic partnerships. Spiderweb Show was one of our well was one of our first partners, and it gave us an opportunity to connect to connect with an audience. Well, you guys. Uh, we also connected with the Playwrights Guild of Canada, and that gave us a chance to partner with writers. And uh, that also gave us an opportunity to write and put together contracts, because that's another thing that we just didn't think about, which is this is new, so there are no collective agreements. There are no people, we're, we're, everybody's trying to figure this out. Um, so how does that deal with rights? How do you deal with just fees? How do you deal with um, the global, uh, the global uh, reach of podcasting? So we spent about nine months uh, working out an agreement with ATRA, and to their credit, ATRA was, they, they were, they worked hard to make this work. They were very careful to protect the interests of their, their performers and their members, but they also made sure that we could figure something out to make it work. Um, we also worked with the Playwrights Guild. I'm actually on the board of the Playwrights Guild, so we were able to work something out. And from that uh, came a new digital contract for playwrights, for podcasting. And right now there are no contracts and no collective agreements around the world that deal with this. And Canada's the first. And the Playwrights Guild is using this and spreading this out around the world as a template for um, other countries and sister organizations to use that. So eventually this contract's going to be used around the world and it will be a Canadian initiative through the Playwrights Guild. Um, Chris, I'm going to jump in here sure, because yes. I already have so many questions. Sure, yeah. But I want to grab, I want to introduce these folks over here and then yeah. we'll circle back. Absolutely. Especially yes. in this contracting business. Okay. okay. <laughs> that's cool, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's really great. I wonder how that's going to that'll impact us. <laughs> um, so my name is Phelan Johnson. Uh, I am originally from Six Nations Reserve. Um, which is in southern Ontario, about an hour and a half outside of Toronto. Um, I'm Mohawk and Tuscarora, so that makes me Haudenosaunee, so welcome to my land. Uh, <laughs> um, it's really nice to be out looking at this body of water, which is a pretty important body of water to my people. Um, one of our you know, one of our early stories is about uh, a man called the Peacemaker who took a stone canoe across the water and went into uh, upstate New York to unify the five nations, which eventually became the six nations who are my people. So this is really lovely. It's really nice to be able to look at this body of water while we sit here. Um, I am uh, half of The Secret Life of Canada, which is a podcast. But prior to podcasting, um, I was a theater nerd, still am a theater nerd. Um, I went to George Brown Theater School, graduated in 2005. 
Uh, I was an actor for a little while and then sort of transitioned into put more playwriting uh, and that's primarily what I do now. I started doing some directing in this last year. I just finished directing uh, my third show this year, which all three were my own writing, which I don't recommend doing. <laughs> it, makes, it makes you feel weird <laughs> about yourself. Um, but uh, now I'm, I'm really, I am really focused on developing and working on this podcast with Lulia. Uh, we've been doing it for almost a year now, so I feel like we're still relatively new at it. Um, and we started. Feel free to jump in. Oh, in any yeah. Time. I don't want to try. I know it's because we're partners, so we don't know exactly know like who should talk when or. I like hearing your voice. Um, I think we started in the idea happened in March of last year, and then we launched the podcast in September of 2017. And uh, I'm also a playwright and all that too. My name is Leah. And um, the the podcast started because we would meet, we, we both work on plays that deal with a lot of historical moments and history. And so we would meet every now and then and talk about like, Oh my God, I was doing research for this thing, but I found out, like, did you know that this stuff happened here? Or, you know, this we'd, person existed. Yeah, or like, this person's connected to this person. So we'd have a lot of really nerdy playwriting conversations. And then last year was Canada 150. And so we had a lot of discussions about, like, did you hear this got funded for this thing? And it's by all, you know, white people. <laughs> 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 and they're doing an indigenous show or they're doing, you know, like it was, it, it felt weird. It felt that the stories being told through Canada 150 were the same stories that we've heard over and over and over, War of 1812 and Johnny McDonald did this thing and, you know, those types of stories and while those are part of our history, obviously it's not the full story. So we, you know, kind of thought, why don't we try and do a podcast? It will be immediate. We're very used to playwriting where, you know, it's like a five-year development, and then 60 people come, and they're all your relatives, and you get to bed, and you know, and you pump right? And so um, we decided we went to a, so we were like, we're going to do this podcast, but then we realized we don't know anything about podcasts. Yeah, so we looked at each other, and we were like, I, I have no idea. no idea. We are, I mean, mostly digitally enact when it comes to editing, and so we went to a, a two-hour workshop um, for it was specifically for women and people of color um, uh, that was hosted by Katie Jensen and she's a producer she's worked on every, mostly all of the podcasts in Canada and so she gave us this workshop and the end of the workshop was to produce like a 30 second trailer on your show and we knew the name of it we knew we even had the episodes plotted out so we did this short little thing um, and she called us, or she emailed us two days later and said, Can, would you mind if I produce this podcast? And we were like, after you, like, <laughs> please produce this podcast. I don't have to learn a new thing. <laughs> yeah. So we recorded the first episode, and the first episode is on BAMP. And we decided the first season was going to be on places, kind of um, tourist yeah, tourist we, we were effectively trying to ruin uh, tourist spots in Canada, <laughs> yeah. or reframe those spaces so that yeah. while you're looking out at your, you know, beautiful lake from your cottage you're haunted. Window, <laughs> you're haunted <laughs> by <laughs> your privilege, <laughs> essentially. But also, you know, not to not to totally make people feel like shit about themselves for for having that space, but you know, giving the our mandate was sort of just understand the space that you're in and know all of those things about the history, so that while you're enjoying those things, you're aware of the land that you're on and the history that you're standing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we, Katie, told us, you know, the first episode, usually a Canadian podcast, an indie Canadian podcast, it's going to get like. You know, maybe two thousand listeners. That would be, we were like two thousand listeners. That would be a ma That would be more than anyone has ever seen, seen our work. <laughs> 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 yes. um, she said, but it might be even like a hundred people are going to listen. Yeah. So we did the BAMF ep episode and we put it out. We put it out over the. Um, it was long. Uh, yeah, uh, it was a, a Labor, Labor Day. Day, and uh, we watched it like get on the iTunes chart and we're like, woohoo, it's number two hundred like that was huge for us. Mm -hmm. And then it went up and up and up 
and up, and it went to like number two. We yeah. didn't beat out. Uh, it was This American Life. No, it wasn't This American Life. No, Joe Rogan. Was <laughs> <laughs> so, and that episode had, like, I think half a million people listened to that episode. So we were like, okay, so. Wow. Okay. It was weird. <laughs> it was really weird, and it gave us major pause, and, uh, yeah. but we were emboldened to go forward and, and tell these stories. So we, we do have a clip. One of the clips that we have is an episode we just did um, that we said we weren't going to do because we said we're going to do untold and undertold stories. But we, you know, as we tell these stories, the same names, Samuel to Champlain, um, John, John and Donald, these guys keep cropping up because they're part of history. So we wanted to look at the most popular statues in Canada and kind of deconstruct those figures and really talk about the good and the bad. But it's hard history. The thing about our podcast is we deal with really difficult, traumatic experiences. And so one of the things that we try to do is we subvert the history, but we also want to frame it in a palatable way so that people can get through it and really hear it. And it's also for us to get through it because we find it hard. So this is the way that we're framing the statues episode. Each person's history and then decide if they so, we will have an all-Indigenous jury decide, just like the Canadian justice system, no, not necessarily, we are going to take a look at a bunch of people who have monuments, and we'll look at the good and the bad of each person's history, and then decide if they should still get their honour. To be fair, I've modeled this proceeding after the Canadian justice system. So, we will have an all-Indigenous jury decide, just like the Canadian justice system, if these folks' honours and accolades are warranted. If that jury is hung, meaning it can't decide, just like the Canadian justice system, exactly like the Canadian justice system, a black female judge will help decide. <laughs> yes, Phelan, you will be the all in. Yeah, so Phelan was the all indigenous jury and I was the black lady judge. So that's how we frame that because the, the especially John A. McDonald's history uh, is so difficult and it took us all. It was really hard to do the research and try to disseminate that information without re-traumatizing the people that the, that were perpetrated against. Yes. Right. So that's how we um, we try to do it as gently as possible, but without pulling punches, which is hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's our podcast. Oh, thank you, Michael. Yes. So I. I'm probably the only amateur here on the panel. Um, I use that term because I'm not, um, this was a community project for me. Um, and the stories I was concerned about were the uh, stories of theater history, specifically told through the, uh, the histories of design in Canada. Um, this started for me, um, uh, I had the fortune uh, of being heralded in 2008 in Toronto. There are an alternative theater awards. Uh, there are several heraldies here today, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, it occurred to me, these are the alternative theater awards that started in 94, and, the, and they're different than regular awards. They were handed down from person to person each year. So they weren't necessarily for a specific work, they're for a body of work, and they're for uh, everyone who sort of gets the award has a connection to the person who got held the year before. Uh, and it, it struck me, uh, which was probably obvious to everyone, this was uh, that these lineages were not just uh, a different way of honoring each other for the work that we do in the community, but they told a story about Canadian theater history. Uh, and I thought, uh, uh, while I was working uh, in a completely different job than theater, because I had left the business basically in 2004, that this would be a great book uh, on the history of theater in at least Toronto, uh, but the very specific focus of the, you know, the second wave of kind of alternative theater in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, this, the same wave that sort of started the Fringe Festival and the sum, and Summer Works and Rhubarb with Buddies. Uh, and lit a and sort of new fire under different ways to tell stories. Um, I'm not a writer, and that proved to be something that I couldn't wrangle, be mostly because there are, at that point in time, a huge matrix of people that were involved in the Heralds, and pinning each one down to sort of figure out their own histories 
was something that was beyond me. So this kind of started me this idea that we're lo losing history. And it was actually the, um, the unfortunate early death of um, Gina Wilkinson, right? Uh, and, I th and, and she was quite young when she passed. And it struck me that we're losing our history. And because the uh, theater community in Canada is fairly small, uh, I think that the work we produce kind of hits above uh, our weight class, certainly. But uh, it's not, it's almost not considered important enough to collect the smaller stories. And we tell the stories to each other uh, orally, and these can get lost. And when people start to die, we're going to lose important history. Uh, and more specifically for me, because I was a lighting designer for 10 years, uh, design history was one that was almost never recorded. Um, and talk about the ephemeral nature of theater, at least, like after uh, a play is produced, if you're lucky enough, it gets, it gets published, and other people will reinterpret that work and do it again. Uh, and uh, that kind of history, at least, is embedded in the company, but design work really is ephemeral. I mean, the, you can see it in a dumpster in the back at the end of the production, right? <laughs> um, and when you talk about sound or lighting um, or projections, that stuff is lost for good. And production stills and production videos uh, don't really capture it at the moment. Um, and so I thought it was important because I had the opportunity to have some spare time and a willingness to cap start to capture these stories. Um, and what is great about the digital age is that any idiot can have a podcast. Um, and the, 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 like you can, bare minimum, record something in your phone and post it on to some sort of free you know, website. Um, it won't necessarily be consumable because it has to be <laughs> uh, high quality audio you know, that, that people want to listen to. So I had made a commitment to sort of I make an initial investment of some small audio equipment, and I enjoy the sort of technology of that. Um, uh, to sort of make sure that people knew it was listenable, I knew that if I listened to something that had a horrible audio, I'd just turn it off no matter how compelling it was. Um, so I was, I was focused on that, and then obviously exploiting you know, the, my, my network to, to give them the opportunity to tell their stories and encourage them uh, to, that it was actually important for us to tell their stories. I know uh, one of the sort of resounding themes in getting people on the show is to reassure them that their history is important and that people want to hear it. Um, uh, there's a couple of designers that I've been trying to convince now for several years, and they're like, no, no one cares. I'm like, but you're like the top mm -hmm. designer. Like, don't people want to know your story, and they don't want to tell it. Uh, and you can't really force people, but at least you, you know, I can encourage people and, and uh, to, to tell their stories. And I think that people have responded to it. Um, I was talking to Chris earlier about sort of the, the, the way that, that I work, and I, I'm more or less a one-person show. Uh, Lindsay Ann Black, the, um, um, uh, I, I was a former props person and designer uh, who now lives in Stratford, manages my social media for me. Uh, I pay her to do that uh, because I can't. It's just that's just a bridge too far for me. I'm a very busy guy with other things that I do. Uh, so by but interviewing people, editing the show, getting it to the web, and the else is sort of me. And I mean that sort of goes to the uh, the ease with which this can be done. Uh, obviously, the most important thing is to have a compelling show. Um, I get about 2,000 subscribers a month, uh, which accounts for mostly most of the technicians and <laughs> kind of backstage people and designers, and now building an audience of directors and scholars and uh, uh, as well. Um, not a very big, but uh, I think uh, from what I can tell, because I don't do a lot of audience in you know, polling, that uh, they, they value it. And it's been growing, certainly because of the social media work that Means has been doing to, to promote the show, uh, but also because we've can, I've managed to continue doing it uh, uh, over the last, now, four years. Um, so the, the show basically is an interview show. It, I, I didn't bring an audio clip because it's very straightforward. I, we have a discussion from sort of beginning uh, of career to the current point. Um, I've certainly found a way, uh, I certainly have a pattern now where we go through the early history and sort of pick out the things that they, uh, the designer feels is important and then talk about the design philosophy and 
uh, ultimately training too. The audience I see for the show is uh, talking to the um, the studio, the young studio artist or the young uh, uh, university currently enrolled in university learning theater, right? the theater student, um, and that's who we're talking to on the show. Uh, the audience is beyond that, I think, but that's I think that that goal is really important to me. I, I wanted to mention a couple things. Um, In the Martha Mann um, interview that I did, Martha Mann is a now retired designer who came up uh, through the 50s and 60s, worked uh, at CBC and did a lot of opera and television and, and other theater. Uh, uh, what, what was very important in that interview was the identification that Canadian theater is rooted in community theater. That Canadian theater, uh, the modern theater that we know that came out of things like the Sears Toronto Festival and uh, the UC players in Toronto and the Alumni Theater. Uh, and those were community um, projects. Um, they fostered a lot of the playwrights, um, like James Rainey uh, and other big ones that we know from, from the beginning of uh, modern sort of Canadian theater, but um, they were an amateur process. And my fear in producing this show for the last four years is that uh, we've got a lot of good things about that. Uh, we share, we still hold on to a lot of kind of amateur things from that as well. Uh, and I've been trying to sort of get to the roots of those themes uh, in, in the podcast and in the interviews. Uh, and I think that that's something that we don't maybe talk about openly enough. Um, uh, the show can become a bit pessimistic at times, when people talk about the economics of theater and how you build a career in theater. Um, and I think that's also important for people who want to enter the business to sort of come in with their eyes, their eyes wide open. Um, uh, and we've been, at the same time, trying to capture what the artists love about their job as well. Uh, and I think that I've accomplished that. Again, I toil away, much like I did as a lighting designer, I toil away in my little office making these things and then I put them out there and hope that someone listens to them. Uh, it's much the same experience I had as a, as a lighting designer, sort of interacting with people, sort of to talk to them a little bit and then going back and making a thing and then going, oh, is that okay? Uh, and <laughs> so it seems like the same experience. Um, I wish I could build an, an audience in the Philippines. That sounds like the new market I should be hitting. But, um, I suspect it's not going to be uh, not going to be the same thing. So um, that's basically the show. Uh, uh, we've also I've also started producing the Bellows, which is a local uh, uh, Toronto uh, round table that meets once uh, a month, probably eight months of the year, uh, to talk about production and focus things. And that really is just a you know, again, attempt to build community uh, and to connect people and not not uh, relegate people to silos. Uh, for example, I learned uh, a few weeks ago that there are at least five or six designers that work out of uh, the Yukon uh, quite regularly. And I had no idea that there like was a theater community that is going strong up in the Yukon. I, like, how, why did I, didn't I know that? I know there's a touring house up there but that's about all I knew. So I think that hopefully in the future I'll be able to sort of start picking up those communities and then tying everyone together so we can all understand how uh, it is a large and united uh, kind of community across Canada. So that's basically it. I guess I'll leave for more discussions. Thanks, Michael. And thanks to everybody for being here and for giving us an introduction to your work. Unbeknownst to you, I've given our participants here a secret task, which was to uh, uh, think of questions <coughs> to ask of each other. So, who wants to jump in? I did it too, but I'm looking to you first. You, collectively. You, you start talking, so it's you. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I guess... I'll give you a moment to think if you want. No, okay. this is where I don't know if it's any good or not, though. Uh, so if it's not, just, you know. It's just going to be live stream, so don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, For me, I guess because I never, uh, you know, the podcasting came pretty quickly. Um, for me, I, lo I have loved them since I discovered them. have been listening to them for years. 
had always been sort of interested in it, but just assumed that it would never be a path that I went down, but then I ended up in that path. But I'm curious for everyone here, how do you find that theater plays into your podcast work? Whatever skills you have from theater or have from theater, did they feed into what you make or how do they feed into what you make? Chris? Um, <laughs> that's, no, that's great. Um, I think it all comes down to, to storytelling. And one thing that surprised me is if, it, if the script is really good, if the dialogue's really good, you don't really have to change anything. Occasionally we have to substitute the word, why did you pick that up with why did you pick up the, the knife? Or, so that's a little over dramatic. But uh, they're very, very rare. So I think it's, it's storytelling, and if it's a really good story, it will translate and you can, you can shift it into different ways. I would agree. I think I found early, uh, you know, I'm not, again, not a trained journalist or interviewer, but you get a sense when you're talking to somebody where the story is going uh, and that there is an arc and when there's a rest and when, you know, now is the time where we transition. And that uh, is something that occurred maybe about four or five interviews in. I kind of realized what the structure was because um, I was really just making it up as I went along. Uh, and. Uh, it, the other thing I think that was really kind of important is that uh, even though I mean, we all have our own personal stories that we think are you know very individualistic or very mundane because they happen to us, and of course that happened. But everybody's story is interesting, um, and it, it almost it doesn't matter. Uh, it almost doesn't matter what the subject matter. Um, the we all have you know turning points and twists in our life and decisions we made and crises and how we face them is is uh, is universal in many ways right so uh, it became easier after I realized that um, I'm like this is just another story that I'm telling and that uh, I'm here to sort of encourage them to uh, tell me what they think of the world and. As long as I remain curious, uh, then everything's going to be okay. You sort of let yourself go into the story. And what is really funny is that we, I, I don't edit the, the podcast down. I don't. Uh, I had. Um, that's not entirely true. Um, uh, Jim Plaxton's interview kind of went in many different directions. <laughs> He's uh, a great guy, but we had a very, <laughs> very kind of tangential conversation, so I had to sort of like think about the story and move things around. But most of the time, I, I don't edit very much at all. I edit from space, maybe. Uh, and I just let it go for the whole it, it, Every single time, though, two hours is about as much as we can talk about a story um, uh, about someone's life. Uh, and it was really interesting to sort of discover that. So your podcasts are on average two hours long? They're two hours long. Wow. And people listen to them in chunks. I used to chunk them in hours. Like I used to go, the first six episodes are one interview that's chunked in two. Uh, but uh, first of all, that's twice the work. Um, and I got things to do. And uh, people I discovered were, were, like one hour itself is even too long. So people were chunking that up into different listening things. So I just thought I'm just going to do the whole interview and they will listen to it over a series of weeks or days, uh, and I'll let them interact with the story as they will. And what's more important to me is to capture the entire story and not just edit it down to a compelling 15 minutes, uh, because it's a historical artifact, and I think that's important. Uh, yeah. I have a question. It's actually about Secret Life of Canada. Um, well, one thing I have to say, I listened to the uh, that episode last night, um, and listen to the trial of John A. McDonald and then walking down to here I walk by the yeah. statue of John A. McDonald and it gave me a whole new perspective. And I think the thing that's so refreshing is you're hearing an indigenous perspective, you're hearing a person of color's perspective. You don't hear that a lot in podcasts. Even though the audience is young, the audience is more diverse, you're not hearing that. So I guess the question for you two is what changes need to be done so that there's, there are more perspectives out there. Well, I definitely think one of the reasons I thought oh, I could do a podcast is because 
I only started really listening to podcasts in 2016 during the election. So I was like, what is happening in the States? And um, then when that got too much, I was listening to all these politics podcasts. I stopped and I just started doing deep dives. And I discovered this huge array of black voices doing podcasts. And black, black podcasts for black people. They, they were not for white audiences, even though a lot of white people listen to them. I, I just found it fascinating. You don't hear that in Canada a lot of just a story for the people, your, your stories for your people kind of thing. And so that was definitely, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this podcast and, 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 and reframe history from our lens. I think what needs to change for more people is just it's a cycle. It's more of us doing this and more, and more people of color going, oh, I can do that because that's the reason I thought I could do it because I listened to The Read and I listened to The Knot and I listened to like all of these podcasts where I was like, these are just brown people, black people doing, doing this. And it's not, it is not a huge, there are access issues in podcasting, but I believe they're not as big as they are in theater. They're not as big in a lot of art forms where access means usually you have to have some sort of training and there is a lot of st structural barriers that prevent people from being able to fully participate. So I think that's the great thing about podcasting is you're right, you just you need your iPhone and you need a laptop, go to the library. Toronto Library has podcasting um, equipment and sessions, you know, so it is accessible in that way. Yeah, uh, I think I think mentorship, access like access to resources uh, to be able to do it. Uh, like on you know, I know that there would be some kids and some young people on my reserve who would love to do it if they felt like they could. Uh, but I feel like it's still such a new form that a lot of people still don't understand how it works exactly. Um, like I know kids on my reserve who who DJ on CKRZ, Voice of the Grand. Um, and so I know that there is some interest in, in the form of storytelling in an audio format, but but I don't think that they know that they can yet. So I think, you know, things like Ryan McMahon um, does workshops and things like that in community. And I think those kinds of things are the seeds that specifically for Indigenous people will help to create that. I mean, it's always going to be a, a challenge when you're looking, when you're on a reserve where the internet is good in some spots, maybe if you're lucky, terrible in other spots and some places don't have it at all. So then, you know, how do we get those stories out? But I think once we do, it's really going to change the way that, hopefully, the way that we view this place called Canada, because we're not hearing those stories enough, unless, you know, really well-meaning journalist travels up north and hangs out for two weeks and then leaves. <laughs> I have a question about economics. Um, I don't need. I have no. I have a small revenue stream, but it's uh, nobody you know supports it out of few. There's there's a few core few lovely people who support it on Patreon, uh, who are mostly my friends. Uh, but how do you, did you guys find the uh, resources to actually produce this? Uh, because this is obviously taking a significant part of your time. Uh, and uh, when you're talking about producing like a, like a radio drama, a lot of resources see your time and actors and contacts and much of else. How did you, I mean, how do you meet those needs? Um, for us, it's a combination of, we're, we've been very, very blessed. We've had funding from all three levels of government for, and I think it's, it's an easier sell because you're, you're saying, look, we're taking theater, established theater, uh, uh, transforming it into this new platform. Uh, and also we have operating funds as a company, so we're, we're able to put it towards that. Um, but it's a challenge, because that's not going to last forever. So how are you going to be able to create earned revenue? And that's the big question for us. Like, how, do we, how are we able to bring enough money in to not only keep this going, but grow it? Um, and that's one thing we, we've just recently received one of the Canada Council digital grants. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and test a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of options for revenue, and then record that information and then put it together in something that we can share to the sector. So 
Um, that's the big thing. How do you, how, how can you bring cash? I'd love to hear how, how you guys are able to. It's been an interesting <laughs> roller coaster. Um, so really briefly, we were really lucky that we, uh, our first three, our, well, first four, four-ish episodes were sponsored uh, by um, Passport 2017, which was a Canada 150 initiative uh, run by a media company uh, called St. Joseph Media. And so they were just trying to push out content, Canada 150 content. They wanted um, our producer, Katie, to do a history podcast, a 22nd, like, old timey, like, you know, radio, like, well, the war is over. <laughs> Old timey white guy stuff. Yeah. Um, and so she pitched this idea to them, and they were like, oh, "Okay, we'll do that." So we we were funded through them. I mean, it was small; it wasn't a lot, but it was it helped. Um, and then they offered us a, to do more episodes, but they unfortunately didn't want to really pay us anymore, and they wanted to really restrict, start restricting the content and let's push it over you know like that whole conversation started to happen so we um we decided look money's nice but we have to the core of this podcast is this thing and we can't compromise on this thing and then so since then we've been um uh supported basically through our patrons on patreon we have had offers from media companies but the interesting thing about Canadian media media right now that we're learning through a year of doing this is they're also behind on podcasting. So they're like, we, we would love a podcast. Um, so we say, great, we would love to work with you. And they say, um, we don't have any money to pay you, but we can really promote you through all these. And these are like big companies with money, or at least we thought they had money. So that's been interesting to see because yeah. I feel like in a lot in a lot of places that you think are money for podcasting, they're actually quite behind and trying to catch up and they don't have the contracts in place and they're like, well, just sign this contract that we give to journalists that yes. says we own everything for yeah. all time. And we're like, well, you, you can't own us. Like, you yeah. so, so it's been interesting. So we are supported through Patreon right now and yeah. I yeah. see a question here. Yeah, I was just... You know, you get half a million listens. Uh -huh. What what is that worth? Uh -huh. like, I mean, just pure dollars and cents. So the thing is, is that in here's the thing: the the podcasting phenomenon or the structure right now is a U.S. structure, and a U.S. podcast that is doing pretty well gets two million, three million, five million mm -hmm. per episode. So when Canadian media, a lot of the media that we've been talking to says, well, we're, we're going to try and put it into the U.S. structure, see what they say. I'm, tr I'm trying to be very nebulous and not yeah. name names. And like, see if we can get a sponsorship and yeah. see if we can get someone to, you know, to buy an ad. And then they say, oh, well, we've, we've pushed it out, but, but you're going to need five million listeners yeah. per episode. Yeah, sorry, me undies is just like, not on board. <laughs> <laughs> you have five million listeners. Yeah, and so yeah. we say, you know, but it's Canada, but it's like we don't have the population. So But there's a strong arming of getting your content yeah. or exposure yeah. while they sort of hold a carrot in the distance. So I think the biggest thing that we've learned from doing this is um, you need to read contracts so very carefully. You need to put your own language in, and I mean, we are also both producers, and I produced for about ten years. And really, for that time, I thought producing. I was like, why am I doing? Why am I doing this? I would all say that to myself, and it has been my greatest asset because I can read a contract, mm -hmm. and I know. <laughs> and they don't think we know. They don't think we know because we're us, right? So yeah. I think for a lot of artists, there are a lot of artists right now that are getting taken advantage in this new digital age because it's content, content, content. You sign a thing and they have it, they have you forever in that way. So you have to be really careful. So I don't know what the answer is to half a million listeners. Uh, it means a lot to us and it, um, yeah, it means a lot to us. And it means that that story's out there in the world in a way that it wasn't before. And you know, it still kind of shocks me that people don't know the, like at least some of those things, I'm like, oh, they didn't know that. 
that's, I mean, I'm just grateful that that's getting out there into the world. So I guess it's, it's worth all the good feelings inside. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to sell product? Yeah, I need a mattress bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, and the all over yeah, I mean, it, it's also about, like, in terms of selling, it's also, we are three people, two people writing a podcast, and then you really need a person, another person to, to so awesome. do that. Like, we are trying, but, you know, it's just like theater, right? It's like, we only have as many people to do the thing. And then you just get used to doing everything. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question here. I have a question. Um, as a, I mean, mostly I work in marketing in the arts, really. So of course I'm, I'm always interested in. Well, okay, here's a direct question. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Direct question is, do you feel comfortable saying how much you actually uh, bring in through Patreon? Do you? Not really. You don't have to. <laughs> I'm like I leave it up to her. That's fine. <laughs> um, and then the second question, which is just not because also it's being live streamed, so I don't. Right. You can tell yeah. me after. For people yeah. who are trying to advertise, then we yes. are. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. This is um, called internet. <laughs> and then the second question. This is for any of you. Um, thinking about your your audiences, I, I'm kind of curious, uh, not knowing enough about the um, power of the equipment you use or the data that you can harness. So you know you know you get a certain amount of data that you can look at it. Like here, here's our listeners from all over the world or wherever, more local perhaps. Um, do you how often do you look at that? Do you does that inform your um, your your progression of, of story? And um, like it might be when you were talking about your initial story there. And uh, in that question too is I guess the question is how much do you listen to your audience as well? Uh, under the cap of your topic and your, I'm kind of curious for anybody to answer that. Yeah, we we listen. We get a, a a huge amount of response after episodes, and we get a lot of emails and a lot of suggestions. And what we very quickly we're kind of horrified to learn, and then we went, okay, well, we need to talk about that. Is how many kids, teachers play this in classrooms, like yeah. junior high, high school. University. Yeah. Oh, we're using. We met someone who said, um, "I, I use this to. She homeschools her child. And she uses it as curriculum, like wow. for her. So that was a bit. It was pressure. great. Yeah, no pressure. pressure. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have changed a bit in that the first couple episodes, I think we swore a little more, and we've tried to. Nothing else has changed, but we've tried to stop swearing. <laughs> because it's me then. <laughs> yeah, because I thought, well, if it's, if it's teachers just, would say, oh, we listened up until this part right. and then skipped over this or part. Or we, we were releasing bleeped ones too, and there were swears sometimes. Uh -huh. Yeah, for the for the episode on slavery, I swore a lot, and so we did. We released a a, a bleeped version of that episode because I was like, oh, I, I I want the kids to hear it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we do. That's how that's how we respond to it. Can I jump in here, because Chris, I'm curious how <clears throat> listenership might change how you program things, what yeah. you choose. I, I think the stats are like crack. It's really dangerous, because yeah, yeah. you just keep yeah. wanting to yeah. refresh and yeah. see, and you have to <laughs> control yourself not to, because it's more into life, uh, like your family. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can get a lot of information. You can't actually get stats like demographics, etc., from the audio file. But what we do is we look, we have a listen page, and I think that skews a little bit older because you would access it through a browser, whereas I think people who okay. listen on Spotify are a little bit younger. But it gives you sort of a rough picture, and you can see, a, you can get a lot of data and a lot of information. So you can get things like um, uh, the percentage of women versus men who are listening. You can get um, interests, and of course you get geographical, and you can actually tone, like you can dive down into what part of Ontario is listening. Yeah. So we, we take that in and we, um, it does it does impact um, our programming. And also what we try to do is we try to go, okay, this is going to, this is, this is going to get a big audience. This one is not going to, but it's an important piece and it needs to go out. So then we will also take that into account on how we program it and how we put it in the stream. So that hopefully the, the bigger number one will feed you that one. Sure. I don't, uh, I am using uh, Squarespace as a platform to, to distribute. 
And uh, unfortunately, with the there may be a paid version that I don't subscribe to, but the the stats I get are very general, and I basically look at RSS feeds, like who's who's, who's subscribing every month, um, and then combine that with some of the, the smaller couple hundred people who actually access it through the through the web uh, to the to the page. Um, but uh, I don't. I mean, I like to see that go up. But I, it's a very niche podcast, right? So the, uh, I don't get a lot of feedback, uh, which means two things. I mean, one, I, people don't hate it. Which I think I would get like, what the heck are you doing? And I've gone on some rants <laughs> uh, because I've been gripped by many things that have happened in the business. Um, and uh, just because, you know, it's my show and I'm the only person doing it. So this is the thing that's important for me. Uh, and like no one has written me any hate mail, so I think that's good. Um, I do occasionally get uh, uh, some good feedback from educators who have used it and assigned it, and it's being used, I think, as a resource for um, you know people who are studying design. I know that Dave DeGro, who's now doing his, his doctorate at U of T, has used the Jim Plaxton interview for his thesis because it's there's no data. Like what happened past my in the 80s, no one knows. Uh, people who do know, probably do, 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 do remember. It was all a big haze back then. Right? So when Jim remembered, uh, you know, how the space was configured, which is important to like a few people, but it is interesting to those who want to know how how they made all those decisions in that weird space. Um, then you can go to that podcast and find out. And that's and so he's used it there, but I don't pay attention to. Uh, I remember the audience. I like I consider the audience in every single interview because I'm talking to people who uh, have a certain depth of knowledge um, and who have a certain interest. And it's not a not very broad one, uh, broad audience, I should say. So I keep in my mind of that, but I don't look at I look at the stats for my own kind of you know vilification. And to, I mean I can't say good good enough things about Lindsay Ann Black. Like I was at 600 people every month, and then I hired her, and now we're at 2,000. So even just that little bump of social media has helped, but it is a very niche podcast, so I don't really get the granularity of that. Uh, nor do I need to, because I'm not selling anything on it or, or farming it out to that. Yeah. Yes. Um, just wondering, a question that I've had in my head as a theater artist, as I'm sort of starting to dabble with live streaming and podcasting myself, is. You know, how much is this sort of current obsession with going digital just a big audience development exercise as opposed to a true artistic meditation on why we exist? Which, let's, let's all be honest, we all exist as performing artists to have interactions in a public space. So just, I'd love to hear your thoughts because it's like I'm agonizing over it. I'm, I feel like I've come to this festival to share this question with all of you, panelists and, and audience alike. Like, why are we really doing this? Are we super insecure that we're just not accessible enough and we got to get our stuff out of the market? And then do we put stuff out of the market that just sounds like a radio play as opposed to a podcast because we just want to be online? Like, how are you answering that question <coughs> for yourselves? about why you're, why you're doing it. Um, I, I, I'd love to answer that. We really have one goal, and that is to get bums and seats for theaters. And that's how we see, that's what we see our purpose. So it's it's cool. development. It absolutely is, yeah. And also I think, because theater, and what I, what I love about theater is, as a sector, we know that our audience is getting older and our audience is predominantly white, and we need to refresh. And I think podcasting is a brilliant way of being able to do that because the audience is young, it's more diverse, and also we can easily get sort of sucked into this little world where we're just putting on shows for each other and we have to start to put on shows right. for people outside. So ultimately, why are we, do, why, why are we doing playing? It's to, it's to try and build the theater. But are you Sorry. concerned about when that audience who might be looking for a podcast discovers a play that's that's been recorded? Yeah. That it's also going to reconfirm like, oh, I'm not into theater because it's so not. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. That, that's that's my other concern is that uh, um, sometimes we can just reconfirm people's perceptions because also it's not being experienced live, so we're not getting no, that I direct think, thing. I think that perception could be perceived by going to a live show. Like, there, you can't yeah. really control how people perceive art, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think for our podcast, we just really want these stories to get out there. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a, a connected to, I mean, it is our art, but it, I, I don't feel like it's connected in that way. I, I really just want people to know these stories, to know these people's names, to to walk down the street and see that John A. McDonald statue and go, meh, you know? Um, <laughs> there, is, there is also something or, in, in or. the fact that, you know, we are these amateur historians who do a podcast, but we're playwrights, and everything is always framed as playwrights, or that comes up a lot in the podcast, like a theater thing that we've worked on, or, um, you know, a directing thing, or a show, like, it's, it's interwoven into it, so it's almost like, yes, we're doing this podcast, but this is who we are, like, we are playwrights who are doing this podcast, so it's, it's normalizing theater in some way, you know, we walk among you, uh, but, like, in, in a way, you know, because I think, I don't know, I think probably all of us in the room at some point have resented what we chose to do with our lives, because it's so hard, uh, and it takes so much work and so much heart, and then sometimes no one comes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in a way, you know, we talk about being playwrights or, or artists, and that feeds into it. And I think it just has to feel right for you. If it does not feel authentic for you to put it online or do a podcast, then don't. Don't do it. I don't. I think people will feel that. I think the reason our podcast is successful is because we we have a lot of passion for it and we feel really deeply about the stories but if we didn't i don't think it would be the same yeah you cry like every time <laughs> I do. not on air i cry my own time in front of ellen and they spend it out have you guys thought of doing it live like doing live recordings and getting a live audience for your for your uh, podcast yeah yeah, we, we want to. It's definitely it's something Leah's really been done and for since we started a live yeah. show. So there are some ideas yeah. kicking around. <laughs> it's really funny that you mentioned that because our next session is uh, with Michael Wheeler and Jesse Brown. We're going to talk about Canada Land, the podcast, mm -hmm. and how that's translated to being a live show. Mm -hmm. So stick around. I'm not wrapping this up quite yet, but that is a consideration. Like, how does it translate? How does it change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can I just add one thing to, to your question, and that is, we kind of see it, we talked earlier, uh, the session before, about disruption. We, we see things potentially shifting more towards the music model, where music is available for free, but the artists make their living through the concerts, through the live events. And we kind of think that maybe theater can shift in that way. You get an opportunity to listen if you've never heard of Hannah Moscovich, and then suddenly you get a chance to listen to, to Bunny. And then maybe the next time her show comes along, you're going to be willing to take that leap to leave your house to buy a ticket to go and see the show. A gateway drug. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to throw in just an audience member to all these podcasts, too. Um, and towards this question about like how you know the forums work and, and, and interact. I feel like there is, like as an avid podcast listener and then also watching emergent forums, like at least in Toronto, like you know, there's a rise in storytelling becoming more of a craft that's getting the respect and that kind of thing. And there's this like for me there seems to be a shift in intimacy of performance that happens with podcasts. Maybe it's the closeness. Um, uh, Donna was talking a little bit about that with the microphone too. Um, in studio, uh, so that intrigues me as the potential that maybe there's some kind of practice happening there. Uh, and I will say absolutely to the point, like uh, Quiver, uh, the podcast episode of Quiver, uh, listening to that, I actually didn't know that much about the play, I, I know of it, but then listening to the podcast and realizing that Anna does this as a solo show, uh, because there was already a performative question meant that I was so much more attracted to see that play. I heard the play, I heard the story, I could understand how it was created in the studio, but to see somebody actually bring this into a live medium and to perform all these different characters and personas uh, through like modification, it was like, this is a, a cyborg play I need to see in a sense, right? And so that becomes a really attractive thing to me uh, in gaining a familiarity with it. So, let's go push out. Can I also mention as well that even though it, it, like the idea 
is that you guys are looking for a broad audience for these stories, that there is something to be said for looking for your own audience. Uh, and uh, you, if, if, especially if you something that's, that's very niche, you may not be able to build an audience live in, uh, the, in Kingston or in Ottawa or in Toronto or Halifax, but you can build one online. And, uh, and still be successful. Now, I'm not a model for making money out of this, out of this kind of prospect, um, but it doesn't mean someone else can't monetize it. So uh, I think uh, uh, audience building uh, aside, I think that the idea that you could take this form and make it its own thing, and I think that theater people are probably equipped to do that really well uh, and tell a very specific podcast or uh, kind of oral media story well. Uh, so, uh, you know, embracing that kind of brave new world uh, aspect of it is probably, uh, I think, equally as well. I think we're willing to question who invents the story more than we have in a hundred years, right? We're in a time of multiple perspectives. We're in a time of reevaluating the story we've been sleepily following along as just the way things are, and I'm speaking with dressed in my skin. <laughs> But I, I'm saying that, that the, the beautiful opportunity is that we, we do celebrate uh, while, we're, while we're looking for collective narratives, we're, we're ennobling individual narratives, uh, and that's how we're shopping. And so the artist, in the, whether it's in the theater or through song or even visual arts, is always questioning what is personal and collective about me, and, and shops it in their community. And the podcast is kind of like a, a perfect, um, very accessible platform for shopping your personal collective experience with the community. And it's beautiful to hear everything you guys are all doing, so thanks. It does strike me that the flip side of that is that we are further part of our own little cavities of echo. Uh, yeah, like, so I'm, I'm, I'm divided in my loyalties. <laughs> like, I'm like, like, to be able to make your story universal and still make it personal, I think, is the, you know, yeah. is the goal in the hand. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I don't know how to do that, but I'm hoping uh, that you guys will continue to do that work soon. And there's a ping pong effect, right? We bounce, we bounce, we bounce from one place to the other and bounce back. Um, and I'm going to bounce down to the clock now and see that I'm going to bring this conversation to a close up here in this format. But the conversation can continue amongst you. Um, we have. I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath on Slack to, for the for the moment when I get the I've got Jesse in the car at the train station message. So we're going to start our next conversation in about 15 minutes with Jesse and Michael. Um, but before we do that, I want to give a big thank you here to... There's a really nice cafe next door if you want to grab a coffee or a muffin, because we're not at lunch until 1. So if you're a bit peckish, uh, just right down there. Uh, and if not, we definitely are going to start at 12.15 because we're going to put Jesse back on a train at 1.40, so everything's very oh. close. <laughs> and if you haven't already, please reserve a spot for uh, good things to do. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.